Chapter Nine of the Maid of Skur. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jennifer Painter. The Maid of Skur by R. D. Blackmore. Chapter Nine. Sand Hills Turned to Sand Holes. While I was talking thus with the boy and expecting his mother every minute, with hope of a little refreshment when the farmer should have dropped off into his usual Sunday sleep, a very strange thing began more and more to force itself on my attention. I have said that the hall of this desolate house was large and long, and had six doorways, narrow arches of heavy stone, without a door to any of them. Three of these arches were at the west, and three at the east end of the room and on the south were two old windows, each in a separate gable, high up from the floor, and dark with stonework and with leadwork, and in the calmest weather these would draw the air and make a rattle. At the north side of the hall was nothing but dead wall, and fireplace, and cupboards, and the broad oak staircase. Having used the freedom to light a pipe, I sat with my face to the chimney-corner, where some wood ashes were smouldering, after the dinner was done with, and sitting thus, I became aware of a presence of some sort over my right shoulder. At first I thought it was nothing more than the smoke from my own pipe, for I puffed rather hard, in anxiety about that little darling. But seeing surprise, and alarm perhaps in Watkins' face, who sat opposite, I turned round, and there beheld three distinct and several pillars of a brownish-yellow light standing over against the doorways of the western end. At first I was a little scared, and the more so because the rest of the hall was darkening, with a pulse of colour gradually vanishing, and for an instant I really thought that the ghosts of the wrecked child's father and mother, and perhaps her nurse, were come to declare the truth about her, and challenge me for my hesitation. But presently I called to mind how many strange things had befallen me, both at sea and on the coast, in the way of feeling and vision too, designed, however, by the power that sends them, more to forewarn than to frighten us, and, as we get used to them, to amuse or edify. Therefore I plucked my spirit up and approached this odd appearance, and found that no part of it was visible upon the spot where it seemed to stand. But Watkin, who was much emboldened by my dauntless carriage, called out in Welsh that he could see me walking in and out of them, like so many haystacks. Upon this I took yet further courage, having a witness so close at hand, and nothing seeming to hurt me. So what did I do but go outside? without any motion of running away, but to face the thing to its utmost, and Watkin, keeping along the wall, took good care to come after me. Here I discovered in half a second that I had been wise as well as strong in meeting the matter valiantly, for what we had seen was but the glancing, or reflection as they call it now, of what was being done outside. In a word, the thick and stifling heat of the day, which had gathered to a head the glaring and blazing power of the last two months of hot summer, was just beginning to burst abroad in whirlwind, hail and thunder. All the upper heaven was covered with a spread of burning yellow. All the halfway sky was red as blood with fibres under it, and all the sides and margin looked as black as the new tarred bends of a ship. But what threw me most astray was that the whole was whirling, tossing upwards jets of darkness as a juggler flings his balls, yet at one time spinning round and at the same time scowling down. It is a hurricane, said I, having seen some in the West Indies which began like this. Watkin knew not much of my meaning, but caught hold of my coat and stood and in truth it was enough to make not only a slip of a boy, but a veteran sailor stand and fear. Not a flash of lightning yet broke the expectation of it, 
nor had been a drop of rain but to my surprise and showing how little we know of anything over the high land broke a sandstorm such as they have in africa it had been brewing some time most likely in the kenvig burrows toward the westward and the windward though no wind was astir with us i thought of a dance of water-spouts such as we had twice encountered in the royal navy once i know was after clearing the mouth of the strait of malaccas where the other was i truly forget having had so much to go everywhere but this time the whirling stuff was neither water nor smoke nor cloud but sand as plain as could be it was just like the parson's hourglass only going up not coming down and quickly instead of slowly and of these funnels spinning around and coming near and nearer there may have been perhaps a dozen or there may have been three score they differed very much in size according to the breadth of whirlwind and the stuff it fed upon and the hole in the air it bored but all alike had a tawny colour and a manner of bulking upward and a loose uncertain edge often lashing off in frays and between them black clouds galloped and sometimes two fell into one and bodily broke downward then a pile as big as newton rock rose in a moment anyhow hill or valley made no odds sand hill or sand bottom the sand was in the place of the air and the air itself was sand many people have asked me over and over again because such a thing was scarcely known except at the great storm of sand four hundred years ago they say our people ever so many times assert their privilege to ask me now again especially how many of these pillars there were i wish to tell the truth exactly having no interest in the matter and if i had no other matter would it be to me and after going into my memory deeper than ever i could have expected there would be occasion for all i can say is this legion was their number because they were all coming down upon me and how could i stop to count them watkin lost his mind a little and asked me with his head gone under my regulation coat if i thought it was the judgment day to this question i replied distinctly in the negative as the man of the paper wrote when i said no about poaching and then i cheered young watkin up and told him that nothing more was wanted than to keep a weather helm before his wit could answer helm so much as to clear my meaning the storm was on me and broke my pipe and filled my lungs and all my pockets and spoiled every corner of the hat i had bought for my dear wife's funeral i pulled back instantly almost as quickly as boy watkin could and we heard the sand burst over the house with a rattle like shot and a roar like cannon and being well inside the walls we fixed our eyes on one another in the gloom and murkiness as much as we could do for coughing to be sure of something where is bardie gone i asked as soon as my lungs gave speech to me it should have been where is bunny gone but my head was full of the little one who can tell cried the boy in welsh being thoroughly scared of his english oh die oh dear god the great only knows god will guard her i said softly yet without pure faith in it having seen such cruel things but the boy's face moved me moreover Bardy seemed almost too full of life for quenching and having escaped rocks waves and quicksands surely she would never be wrecked upon dry land ignobly nevertheless at the mere idea of those helpless little ones out in all this raging havoc tears came to my eyes until the sand of which the very house was full crusted up and blinded them it was time to leave off thinking if one meant to do any good the whirlwind spun and whistled round us now on this side now on that and the old house creaked and rattled as the weather pulled or pushed at it the sand was drifted in the courtyard without any special whirlwind 
three feet deep in the northeast corner, and the sky from all sides fell upon us like a mountain undermined. Boy, go into your mother, I said, and I thank God for enabling me, else might she have been childless. Tell your mother not to be frightened, but to get your father up and to have the kettle boiling. Oh, Dio, dear Dio, let me come with you after that poor little child and after my five brothers. Go in, you helpless fool, I said, and he saw the set of my countenance and left me, though but half content. It needed all my strength to draw the door of the house behind me, although the wind was bent no more on one way than another, but universal uproar, and downroar too, for it fell on my head quite as much as it jerked my legs, and took me aback, and took me in front, and spun me round, and laughed at me. Then, of a sudden, all wind dropped, and yellow sky was over me. What course to take? if I had the choice, in search of those poor children, was more at first than I could judge, or bring my mind to bear upon. For as sure as we live by the breath of the Lord, the blast of his anger deadens us. Perhaps it was my instinct only, having been so long afloat, which drove me, straight as affairs permitted, towards the margin of the sea. And perhaps I had some desire to know how the sea itself would look under this strange visiting. Moreover, it may have come across me, without any thinking twice of it, that Bunny had an inborn trick of always running toward the sea, as behoved a sailor's daughter. Anyhow, that way I took, so far as it was left to me to know the points of the compass, or the shape and manner of anything, for simple and short as the right road was, no simpleton or short-witted man could have hit it or come near it in that ravenous weather. In the whirl and grim distortion of the air and the very earth, a man was walking, as you might say, in the depth of a perfect calm, with stifling heat upon him, and a piece of shadow to know himself by. And then, the next moment, there he was in a furious state of buffeting, baffled in front and belaboured aback and bellowed at under the swing of his arms, and the staggering failure of his poor legs. Nevertheless, in the lull and the slack times, I did my utmost to get on, having more presence of mind, perhaps, than any landsman could have owned. Poor fellows they are when it comes to blow, and what could they do in a whirlwind? As I began to think of them, and my luck in being a seaman, my courage improved to that degree that I was able quite heartily to commend myself to the power of God, whom, as a rule, I remember best when the world seems coming to an end. And I think it almost certain that this piety on my part enabled me to get on as I did. For without any skill at all, or bravery of mine, but only the calmness which fell upon me, as it used to do in the heat of battle, when I thought on my maker, all at once I saw a way to elude a great deal of the danger. This was as simple as could be, yet never would have come home to a man unable to keep his wits about him. Blurred and slurred as the whole sky was with twisted stuff and with yellowness, I saw that the whirling pillars of sand not only whirled, but also travelled in one spiral only. They all came from the west, where lay the largest spread of sand hills, and they danced away to the northeast first, and then away to south of east, shaping around like a ship with her helm up, preserving their spiral from left to right, as all waterspouts do on the north of the line. So when a column of sand came nigh to suck me up, or to bury me, although it went thirty miles an hour, and I, with the utmost care of my life, could not have managed ten, perhaps, by porting my helm without carrying sail, and so working a traverse, I kept the weather gauge of it, and that made all the difference. Of course I was stung in the face and neck, as bad as a thousand mosquitoes, when the skirts of the whirl flapped round at me, but what was that to care about? It gave me pleasure to walk in such peril, 
and feel myself almost out of it by virtue of coolness and readiness nevertheless it gave me far greater pleasure i can assure you to feel hard ground beneath my feet and stagger along the solid pebbles of the beach of skur where the sandstorm could not come so much hereupon i do believe that in spite of all my courage so stout and strong in the moment of trial all my power fell away before the sense of safety what could my old battered life matter to any one in the world except myself and bunny however i was so truly thankful to kind providence for preserving it that i cannot have given less than nine jumps and said matthew mark luke and john three times over and in both ways this brought me back to the world again as any power of piety always does when i dwell therein and it drove me thereupon to trust in providence no longer than the time was needful for me to recover breathing when i came to my breath and prudence such a fright at first oppressed me that i made a start for running into the foremost of the waves thinking if i thought at all of lying down there with my head kept up and defying the sand to quench the sea soon however i perceived that this was not advisable such a roar arose around me from the blows of hills and rocks and the fretful eagerness of the sea to be at war again and the deep sound of the distance the voice of man could travel less than that of a sandpiper and the foot of man might long to be the foot of a sandhopper for the sea was rising fast up the verge of ground swell and a deep hoarse echo rolling down the shoaling of the surges this to me was pleasant music such as makes a man awake the colour of the sun and sky was just as i had once beholden near the pearl grounds of ceylon where the bottom of the sea comes up with a very mournful noise and the fish sing dirges and no man however clear of eye can open the sea and the sky asunder and by this time being able to look round a little for the air was not so full of sand though still very thick and dusty i knew that we were on the brink of a kind of tornado as they call it in the tropics a storm that very seldom comes into these northern latitudes being raised by violence of heat as i have heard a surveyor say the air going upward rapidly with a great hole left below it now as i stood on watch as it were and being in such a situation longed for more tobacco what came to pass was exactly this so far as a man can be exact when his wits have long been failing him the heaven opened or rather seemed to be cloven by a sword sweep and a solid mass of lightning fell with a cone like a red-hot anvil the ring of black rocks received its weight and leaped like a boiling cauldron while the stormy waters rose into a hiss and heap of steam then the crash of heaven stunned me when i came to myself it was raining as if it had never rained before the rage of sand and air was beaten flat beneath the rain and the fretful lifting of the sea was hushed off into bubbles what to do i could not tell in spite of all experience but rubbed the sand from both my eyes as bad as the beard of an oyster and could see no clear way anywhere now the sky was spread and traversed with a net of crossing fires in and out like mesh and needle only without time to look some were yellow some deep red and some like banks of violet and others of a pale sweet blue like gazing through a window they might have been very beautiful and agreeable to consider if they had been further off and without that wicked crack of thunder through the roar worse storms i had seen of course in the hot world and up mountains and perhaps thought little of them but then there was this difference i had always plenty of fellows with me and it was not sunday also i then was young and trained for cannons to be shot at me neither had i a boat of my own but my dear wife was alive 
these considerations moved me to be careful of my life a duty which increases on us after the turn of the balance and seeing all things black behind me and a world of storm around knowing every hole as i did with many commendations of myself to god for the sake of bunny in i went into a hole under a good solid rock where i could watch the sea and care for nothing but an earthquake End of chapter 9chapter 10 of the maid of skur this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by jennifer painter the maid of skur by r d blackmore chapter 10 under the rock for a while the power of the lightning seemed to quench the wind almost and one continuous roar of thunder rang around the darkness then with a bellow the wind sprang forth like a wild bull out of a mountain and shattered the rain and drowned the thunder and was lord of everything under its weight the flat sea quivered and the crests flew into foam and the scourge upon the waters seemed to beat them all together the whirlwinds now were past and done with and a violent gale begun and in the burst and change of movement there appeared a helpless ship she was bearing towards pool tavan as poor bardi's boat had done but without the summer glory and the golden wealth of waves all was smooth and soft and gentle as the moonlight in a glass when the little boat came gliding with its baby captain all was rough and hard and furious as a fight of devils when that ship came staggering with its load of sin and woe and yet there had not been so much as twenty-four hours between the two not one of our little coasting vessels but a full-rigged ship she loomed a foreign build although at present carrying no colours i saw at once what her business was to bring from the west indies sugar rum and such like freight to bristol or to the dutchman this was in her clearance bill but behind that she had other import not so clearly entered in a word she carried negroes from the overstocked plantations not to be quite slaves at least in the opinion of their masters but to be distributed for their own christian benefit at a certain sum per head among the bristol or dutch merchants or wherever it might be and it serves them right i always say for the fuss we now make about those black men must bring down the anger of the creator who made them black upon us as the gale set to its work and the sea arose in earnest and the lightning drifted off into the scud of clouds i saw as plain as a pikestaff that the ship must come ashore and go to pieces very likely before one could say jack robinson she had been on the skur weather sands already and lost her rudder and some of her stern post as the lift of the water showed and now there was nothing left on board her of courage or common seamanship the truth of it was although of course i could not know it then that nearly all the ship's company acted as was to be expected from a lot of foreigners that is to say if such they were they took to the boats in a kind of panic when first she struck among the sands in the whirlwind which began the storm there could have been then no great sea running only quiet rollers and being but two miles off the shore they hoped no doubt to land well enough after leaving the stupid negroes and the helpless passengers to the will of providence however before they had rowed a mile with the flood tide making eastward one of the boats was struck by lightning and the other caught in a whirl virago as the spaniards call it and not a soul ever came to land and scarcely any bodies both these accidents were seen from porthcall point by sandy mcgraw through a telescope and much as he was mine enemy 
I do him the justice to believe it, partly because he could look for no money from any lies in the matter, and still more because I have heard that some people said that they saw him see it. But to come back to this poor ship, the wind, though blowing madly enough, as a summer gale is often hotter for a while than a winter one, had not time and sweep as yet to raise any very big rollers. The sea was sometimes beaten flat, and then cast up into hillocks, but the mighty march of waters, fetched by a tempest from the Atlantic, was not come, and would not come in a veering storm like this, for it takes a gale of at least three tides, such as we never have in summer, to deliver the true buffet of the vast Atlantic. Nevertheless, the sea was nasty and exceeding vicious, and the wind more madly wild, perhaps, than when it has full time to blow. In short, the want of depth and power was made up by rage and spite. And for a ship not thoroughly sound and staunch in all her timbers, it had been better, perhaps, to rise and fall upon long billows, with a chance of casting high and dry, than to be twirled round and plucked at, thrown on beam ends, and taken aback, as this hapless craft was being, in the lash of rocky waters and the drift of gale and scud. By this time she was close ashore, and not a man, except myself, to help or even pity her. All around her was wind and rocks, and a mad sea rushing under her. The negroes, crouching in the scuppers, or clinging to the masts and rails, or rolling over one another in their want of pluck and skill, seemed to shed their blackness on the snowy spray and curdled foam, like cuttlefish in a lump of froth. Poor things! They are grieved to die as much, perhaps, as any white man, and my heart was overcome, in spite of all I know of them. The ship had no canvas left, except some tatters of the fore topsail and a piece of the main royals, but she drifted broadside on, I dare say five or six knots an hour. She drew too much water, unluckily, to come into Pool Tavan at that time of the tide, even if the mouth had been wide enough, but crash she went on a ledge of rocks thoroughly well known to me, every shelf of which was a razor. Half a cable's length below the entrance to Pool Tavern, it had the finest steps and stairs for congers and for lobsters, whenever one could get at it in a low spring tide, but the worst of beaks and barbs for a vessel to strike upon at half flow, and with a violent sea, and a wind as wild as bedlam. With the pressure of these, she lay so much to leeward before striking, and perhaps her cargo had shifted, that the poor blackies rolled down the deck like pickling walnuts on a tray, and they had not even the chance of dying each in his own direction. I was forced to shut my eyes, till a grey squall came, and caught her up, as if she had been a humming-top, and flung her, as we drown a kitten, into the mashing waters. Now I hope no man who knows me would ever take me for such a fool as to dream for a moment, after all I have seen of them, that a negro is our own flesh and blood, and a brother immortal, as the parsons begin to prate, under some dark infection. They differ from us a great deal more than an ass does from a horse, but for all that I was right down glad, as a man of loving kindness, that such a pelt of rain came up as saved me from the discomfort or pain, if you must have the truth, of beholding several score, no doubt, of unfortunate blacks a-drowning. If it had pleased Providence to drown any white men with them, and to let me know it, beyond a doubt I had rushed in, though without so much as a rope to help me, and as it was I was ready to do my very best to save them, if they had only shown some readiness to be hauled ashore by a man of proper colour, but being, as negroes always are, of a most contrary nature, no doubt they preferred to drift out to sea rather than Christian burial. At any rate, none of them came near me, kindly disposed as I felt myself, and ready to tuck up my Sunday trousers at the very first sight of a woolly head. 
but several came ashore next tide, when it could be no comfort at all to them, and such, as I have always found, is the nature of black people. But for me it was a sad, and as I thought severe visitation to be forced on a Sabbath day, my only holiday of the week, to meditate over a scene like this. As a truly consistent and truth-seating Christian, especially when I grow round with fish on a Monday morning among non-conformists, it was a bitter trial for me to reflect upon those poor negroes, gone without any sense at all, except a good Christian's wickedness, to the judgment we decree for all, except ourselves and families. But there was worse than this behind, for after waiting as long as there seemed good chance of anything coming ashore, which might go into my pocket, without risk of my pension, and would truly be mine in all honesty, and after seeing that the wreck would not break up till the tide rose higher, though all on board were swept away, suddenly it came into my head about poor Bardy and Bunny. They were worth all the niggers that ever made coal look for colour of pipe-clay, and with a depth of self-reproach, which I never deserved to feel, having truly done my utmost, for who could walk in such weather, forth I set, resolved to face whatever came out of the heavens. Verily nothing could come much worse than what was come already. Rheumatics, I mean, which had struck me there, under the rock, as a snake might. Three hours ago all the world was sweat, and now all the air was shivers. Such is the climate of our parts, and many good people rail at it, who have not been under discipline but all who have felt that gnawing anguish, or that fiery freezing, burning at once, and benumbing, like a dead bone put into the live ones, with a train of powder down it, all these will have pity for a man who had crouched beneath a rock for at least three hours, with dripping clothes, at the age of two and fifty. For a hero I never set up to be, and never came across one until my old age in the navy, as hereafter to be related. And though I had served on board of one in my early years, off La Hague and Cape Grinez, they told me she was only a woman that used to hold a lantern. Hero, however, or no hero, in spite of all discouragement and the aching of my bones, resolved I was to follow out the fate of those two children. There seemed to be faint hope indeed concerning the little stranger, but Bunny might be all alive and strong, as was right and natural for a child of her age and substance. But I was sore downcast about it when I looked around and saw the effect of the storm that had been over them, for the alteration of everything was nothing less than amazing. It is out of my power to tell you how my heart went up to God, and all my spirit and soul was lifted into something purer when, of a sudden, in a scoop of sand, with the rushes overhanging, I came on those two little dears, fast asleep in innocence. A perfect nest of peace they had, as if beneath their father's eye, and by his own hand made for them. The fury of the earth and sky was all around and over them. The deep revenge of the sea was rolling, not a hundred yards away, and here those two little dots were asleep, with their angels trying to make them dream. Bunny, being the elder and much the stronger child, had thrown the skirt of her frock across poor little Bardie's naked shoulders, while Bardie, finding it nice and warm, had nestled her delicate head into the lap of her young nurse, and had tried, as it seemed, before dropping off, to tell her gratitude by pressing Bunny's red hands to her lips. In a word, you might go a long way and scarcely see a prettier or more moving picture, or more apt to lead a man who seldom thinks of his maker. As for me, I became so proud of my own granddaughter's goodness, and of the little lady's trust and pure repose therein, that my heart went back at once to my dead boy Harry, and I do believe that I must have wept if I could have stopped to look at them. But although I was truly loath to spoil this pretty picture, the poor things must be partly wet, even in that nest of rushes, which the whirlwinds had not touched. 
so I awoke them very gently, and shook off the sand, while they rubbed their eyes, and gaped, and knew no more of their danger than if they had been in their own dear beds. Then, with Bardy in my arms, and Bunny trotting stoutly with her thumb spliced into my trousers, I shaped a course for Skur farmhouse, having a strong gale still abaft, but the weather slightly moderating. End of chapter 10「The Maid of Skur」This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jennifer Painter The Maid of Skur by R. D. Blackmore Chapter 11 A Wrecker Wrecked Near the gate I met Evan Thomas, the master of the house himself, at length astir, but still three parts drunk, and, if I may say so with due compassion for the trouble then before him, in a very awkward state of mind. It happened so that the surliness of his liquor and of his nature mingled at this moment with a certain exultation, a sense of good luck, and a strong desire to talk and be told again of it and this is the nature of all Welshmen, directly they have any luck, they must begin to brag of it. You will find the same in me, perhaps, or at any rate think you do, although I try to exclude it, having to deal with Englishmen, who make nothing of all the great deeds they have done until you begin to agree with them. And then, my goodness, they do come out. But the object of my writing is to make them understand us, which they never yet have done, being unlike somehow in nature, though we are much of their fathers. Having been almost equally among the, both these nations, and speaking English better perhaps than my native tongue of the Cymri, of which anybody can judge who sees the manner in which I do it, it is against my wish to say what Evan Thomas looked like. His dark face, overhung with hair, and slouched with a night of drinking, was beginning to burn up, from paleness and from weariness, into a fury of plunder. Scarcely did I know the man, although I had so many recollections of evil against him. A big, strong, clumsy fellow at all times, far more ready to smite than smile, and wholly void of that pleasant humour, which among almost all my neighbours, though never yet could I find out why, creates a pleasing eagerness for my humble society, as punctual as my pension day. But now his reeling, staggering manner of coming along towards us, and the hunching of his shoulders, and the swagging of his head, and most of all, the great gun he carried, were enough to make good, quiet people who had been to church get behind a sand hill. However, for that it was too late. I was bound to face him. Bardie dropped her eyes under my beard, and Bunny crept closer behind my leg. For my part, although the way was narrow, and the lift of the storm gave out some light, it would have moved no resentment in me if he had seen, as rich men do, unfit to see a poor man. However, there was no such luck. He carried his loaded gun with its muzzle representing a point of view the very last I could have desired, namely, at my midships, and he carried it so that I longed to have said a little word about carefulness, but I durst not, with his coal-black eyes fixed upon me as they were, and so I pulled up suddenly, for he had given me an imperious nod, as good as ordering me to stop. Wreck ashore, he cried out in Welsh, having scarce a word of English. Wreck ashore! I smell her, Dio. Don't tell me no lies, my boy. I smelled her all the afternoon, and high time to have one. There is a wreck ashore, I answered, looking with some disgust at him, as a man who has been wrecked himself must do at a cruel wrecker. But the ebb most likely will draw her off and drift her into the quicksands. 
great god speak not like that my boy the worst you are of everything if those two children came ashore there must have been something better and he peered at the children as if to search for any gold upon them neither child came from that wreck one is my granddaughter bunny bunny show yourself to black evan but the child shrank closer behind me evan black you know her well and the other is a little thing i picked up on the coast last night ha ha you pick up children where you put them i suppose but take them indoors and be done with them cubs to come with a wreck ashore a noble wreck ashore i say but come you down again fisherman dio he used the word fisherman with a peculiar stress and a glance of suspicion at my pockets come you down again dio dear i shall want you to help me against those thieves from kenvig bring my other gun from the clock case and tell the boys to run down with their bando sticks i'll warrant we'll clear the shore between us and then good dio honest dio you shall have some you shall you dog fair play dio fair share and share though every stick is mine of right ah dio dio you cunning sheep's head you love a keg of rum you dog this i knew to be true enough but only within the bounds of both honesty and sobriety but so much talking had made his brain in its present condition go round again and while i was thinking how far it might be safe and right to come into his views his loaded gun began wagging about in a manner so highly dangerous that for the sake of the two poor children i was obliged to get out of his way and looking back from a safer distance there i beheld him flourishing with his arms on the top of a sand hill and waving his hat on the top of his gun for his sons to come over the warren moxy thomas was very kind she never could help being so and therefore never got any thanks she stripped the two wet children at once and put them in bed together to keep each other warm but first she had them snugly simmering in a milk pan of hot water with a little milk for the sake of their skins bunny was heavy and sleepy therein and did nothing but yawn and stretch out her arms bardie on the other hand was ready to boil over with delight and liveliness flashing about like a little dab chick oh davy she said as i came to see her at her own invitation and she sat quite over bunny i'll have a little drop with the water up to her neck she put one mite of a transparent finger to my grizzled mouth and popped a large drop in and laughed until i could have worshipped her now having seen these two little dears fast asleep and warmly compassed i began according to evan's orders to ask about the boys not having seen any sign of them moxy said that watkin went out to look for his five brothers about an hour after i had left and in spite of the rain and lightning she had tried in vain to stop him something was on his mind it seemed and when she went up to attend on his father he took the opportunity to slip out of the kitchen now moxy having been in the house and the house away from the worst of the storm being moreover a woman and therefore wholly abroad about weather it was natural that she should not have even the least idea of the jeopardy encountered by her five great sons in the warren enough for her that they were not at sea danger from weather upon dry land was out of her comprehension it wanted perhaps half an hour of dusk and had given over raining but was blowing a good reef topsail gale when i started to search for the sons of skur of course i said nothing to make their mother at all uneasy about them but took from the clock case the loaded gun as evan had commanded me and set forth upon the track of young watkin better foot foremost for he was likely to know best what part of the warren his five great brothers had chosen for their sport that day and in the wet sand it was easy to follow the course the boy had taken the whirlwinds had ceased before he went forth and the deluge of rain was now soaked in through the drought so long abiding but the wind was wailing pitifully 
and the rushes swaying wearily, and the yellow baldness, here and there, of higher sand-hills, caught the light. Ragged clouds ran over all, and streamers of the sunset, and the sun was like a school let loose, with the joy of wind and rain again. It is not much of me that swears, when circumstances force me, only a piece, perhaps, of custom, and a piece of honesty. These two lead one astray sometimes, and then comes disappointment. For I had let some anger vex me at the rudeness of Black Evan, and the ungodliness of his sons, which forced me thus to come abroad, when full of wet and weariness. In spite of this, I was grieved and frightened, and angry with no one but myself, when I chanced upon Boy Watkin, fallen into a tuft of rushes, with his blue eyes running torrents. There he lay, like a heap of trouble, as young folk do ere they learn the world, and I put him on his legs three times, but he managed to go down again. At last I got his knees to stick, but even so he turned away, and put his head between his hands, and could not say a word to me. And by the way his shoulders went, I knew that he was sobbing. I asked him what the matter was, and what he was taking so much to heart, and, not to be too long over a trifle, at last I got this out of him. "'Oh, good Mr. Llewellyn, dear, I never shall see nothing more of my great brother's five, so long as I ever do live.' and when they kicked me out of bed every Sunday morning, and spread the basins over me, it was not that they meant to harm, I do feel it. I do feel it. And perhaps my knees ran into them. Under the sands, under the sands they are, and never to kick me again no more. Of sorrow it is more than ever I can tell. Watty, said I, why talk you so? "'Your brothers know every crick and corner of this warren, miles and miles, and could carry a sand-hill among them. They are snug enough somewhere with their game, and perhaps gone to sleep, like the little ones.' Of the baby's adventures he knew nothing, and only stared at me. So I asked him what had scared him so. "'Under the sands, the sands they are, so sure as ever I do live, or the rabbit-bag would not be here, and Dutch!' who never, never leaves them, howling at the rabbit-bag. Looking further through the tussocks, I saw that it was even so. Dutch, the mongrel collie, crouched beside a bag of something, with her tail curled out of sight, and her ears laid flat and listless, and her jowl along the ground. And every now and then she gave a low but very grievous howl. "'Now, boy, don't be a fool,' I said, with a desire to encourage him. "'Soon we shall find your brother's five with another great sack of rabbits. "'They left the bitch yonder to watch the sack, while they went on for more, you see.' "'It is the sack, the sack it is, and no other sack along of them. "'Oh, Mr. Llewellyn, dear, here is the bag, and there is Dutch, and never no sign at all of them.' At this I began to fear indeed that the matter was past helping, that an accident and a grief had happened worse than the drowning of all the negroes, which it had ever pleased Providence, in a darkness of mood, to create for us. But my main desire was to get poor Watty away at once, lest he should encounter things too dreadful for a boy like him. "'Go home,' I said, with a bag of rabbits, and give poor Dutch her supper." "'Your father is down on the shore of the sea, and no doubt the boys are with him. "'They are gone to meet a great shipwreck, worth all the rabbits, "'all the way from Dunraven to Giant's Grave.' "'But little Dutch, it is little Dutch. "'They never would leave her, if wreck there was. "'She can fetch out of the water so good as almost as any dog.' "'I left him to his own devices, being now tired of arguing.' for by this time it was growing dark, and a heavy sea was roaring, and the wreck was sure to be breaking up, unless she had been swallowed up, and the common sense of our village and parish would go very hard against me for not being on the spot to keep the adjacent parish from stealing. 
for Kenvig and Newton are full of each other with a fine old ancient hatred. So he climbed over the crest of high sand, where the rushes lay weltering after the wind, and then with a plunge of long strides downhill, and plucking our feet out hastily, on the watered marge we stood, to which the sea was striving. Among the rocks Black Evan leaped, with white foam rushing under him, and sallies of the stormy tide volleying to engulf him. Strong liquor still was in his brain, and made him scorn his danger, and thereby saved him from it. One timid step, and the churning waters would have made a curd of him. The fury of his visage showed that somebody had wronged him, after whom he rushed with vengeance, and his great gun swinging. "'Sons of dogs!' he cried in Welsh, alighting on the pebbles. "'May the devil feed their fathers with a melting bowl!' "'What's the rumpus now?' I asked. "'What have your sons been doing?' For he always swore at his sons as freely as at anybody's, and at himself for begetting them. "'My sons!' he cried, with a stamp of rage. "'If my sons had been here, what man would have dared to do on the top of my head this thing? Where are they? I sent you for them!' "'I have sought for them high and low,' I answered. "'Here is the only one I could find.' "'Watkin! What use of Watkin! A boy like a girl or a baby! I want my five tall bully boys to help their poor father's livelihood. There's little Tom Taylor gone over the sandhills with a keg of something, and Teddy Shoemaker with a spar, and I only shot between them. Cursed fool! What shall I come to not to be able to shoot a man?' He had fired his gun, and was vexed, no doubt, at wasting a charge so randomly. Then spying his other gun on my shoulder, with the flint and the priming set, he laid his heavy hand on it. I scarce knew what to do, but feared any accident in the struggle, and after all, he was not so drunk that the law would deny him his own gun. Ha, ha! with a pat of the breech, he cried. For this I owe thee a good turn, Dio. Thou art loaded with rocks, my darling, as the other was with cowries. Twenty to the pound of lead for any longshore robbers. I see a lot more sneaking down, Dio, now for sport, my boy. I saw some people, dark in the distance, under the brow of a sand hill, and before I could speak or think, Black Evan was off to run at them. I too set my feet for speed, but the strings of my legs hung backward, and Watty, who could run like a hare, seemed to lag behind me, and behind him there was little Dutch, crawling with her belly down, and her eyes turned up at us, as if we were dragging her to be hanged. Until we heard a shout of people, through the roar of wind and sea, in front of where Black Evan strode, and making towards it we beheld, in glimmering dusk of shore and sky, something we knew nothing of. A heavy sand hill hung above them, with its brow come over, and long roots of rushes, naked in the shrillness of the wind. Under this were men at work, as we work for lives of men, and their Sunday shirt-sleeves flashed, white like ghosts, and gone again. Up to them strode Evan Black, over the marge of the wild march tides, and grounded his gun, and looked at them. They for a breath gazed up at him, and seemed to think and wonder, and then, as though they had not seen him, fell again a-digging. "'What means this?' he roared at them, with his great eyes flashing fire, and his long gun levelled. But they neither left their work, nor lifted head to answer him. The yellow sand came sliding down, in wedge-shaped runnels, over them, and their feet sank out of sight, but still they kept on working. "'Come away, then, Evan Great!' "'Come away and seek for wreck!' I shouted, while he seemed to stand in heaviness of wonder. "'This is not a place for you. Come away, my man, my boy!' Thus I spoke, in Welsh, of course, and threw my whole weight on his arm, to make him come away with me. But he set his feet in sand, and spread his legs, and looked at me, and the strongest man that was ever born could not have torn him from his hold, with those eyes upon him. Dio, I am out of dreaming. Dio, I must see this wreck. 
only take the gun from me this i would have done right gladly but he changed his mind about it falling back to a savage mood you down there who gave you leave to come and dig my sand hills answer or have skins of lead two or three of the men looked up and wanted to say something but the head man from the lines who understood the whole of them nodded and they held their tongues either they were brave men all which never is without discipline or else the sense of human death confused and overpowered them whatever they meant they went on digging some damned sailor under there cried evan losing patience little mustard spoons of sand can't you throw it faster fine young fellows three of them in the hole their own ship made last march tide it must have been let us see this new batch come they always seem to have spent their wages before they learned to drown themselves he laughed and laid his gun aside and asked me for tobacco and trying to be sober sang the rising of the lark i for my part shrunk away and my flesh crawled over me work away my lads work away you are all of a mind to warm yourselves let me know when you have done and all you find belongs to me i can sit and see it out and make a list of everything earrings gold and foreign pieces and the trinkets they have worn out with them i know them all fools what use of skulking you're on soft stuff i see have out every one of them so they did and laid before him in the order of their birth the carcasses of his five sons evan first his eldest born thomas next and rees and hopkin and then with the sigh of death still in him jenkin newly turned fifteen End of chapter 11「12 of the Maid of Skur This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jennifer Painter The Maid of Skur by R. D. Blackmore Chapter 12 How to Sell Fish what i had seen that night upset me more than i liked to dwell upon but with all my fish on hand i was forced to make the best of it for a downhearted man will turn meat as we say and much more fish to a farthing's worth and though my heart was sore and heavy for my ancient sweetheart moxy and for little bardie in the thick of such disasters that could be no excuse to me for wasting good fish or at least pretty good and losing thoroughly good money here were the mullet with less of shine than i always recommended and honestly wished them to possess here were the prawns with a look of paleness and almost of languishing such as they are bound to avoid until money paid and counted and most of all here were lawful bass of very great size and substance inclined to do themselves more justice in the scales than on the dish i saw that this would never answer to my present high repute concerning questions afterwards and people being hard upon me out of thoughtless ignorance that was none of my affair the whole of that would go of course upon the weather and sudden changes such as never were known before and if good religious people would not so be satisfied with the will of providence to have their fish as fish are made against them i had another reason which never fails to satisfy the burning tide as they called it through which poor bardy first appeared had been heard of far inland and with one consent pronounced to be the result of the devil improperly flipping his tail while bathing although the weather had been so hot this rumour was beyond my belief nevertheless i saw my way if any old customer should happen when it came to his dinner time to be at all discontented which no man with a fine appetite and a wholesome nose should indulge in i saw my way to sell him more 
upon the following basket day by saying what good people said and how much i myself had seen of it with these reflections i roused my spirits and resolved to let no good fish be lost though it took all the week to sell them for in spite of the laws laid down in the books for young married women and so forth there is scarcely any other thing upon which both men and women may be led astray so pleasantly as why to buy fish and when to buy fish and what fish to buy therefore i started in good spirits on the monday morning carrying with me news enough to sell three times the weight i bore although it was breaking my back almost good fish it was and deserved all the praise that ever i could bestow on it for keeping so well in such shocking weather and so i sprinkled a little salt in some of the delicate places just to store the flavour there for cooks are so forgetful and always put the blame on me when they fail of producing a fine fresh smell also knowing to my sorrow how suspicious people are and narrow-minded to a degree none would give them credit for i was forced to do a thing which always makes me to myself seem almost uncharitable but i felt that i could trust nobody to have proper faith in me especially when they might behold the eyes of the fishes retire a little as they are very apt to do when too many cooks have looked at them and knowing how strong the prejudice of the public is in this respect i felt myself bound to gratify it though at some cost of time and trouble this method i do not mind describing as i am now pretty clear of the trade for the good of my brother fisherman when the eyes of a fish begin to fail him through long retirement from the water you may strengthen his mode of regarding the world and therefore the world's regard for him by a delicate piece of handling keep a ray fish always ready it does not matter how stale he is and on the same day on which you are going to sell your bass or mullet or cod or whatever it may be pull a few sharp spines as clear as you can out of this good ray then open the mouth of your languid fish and embolden the aspect of either eye by fetching it up from despondency with a skewer of proper length extended from one ball to the other it was almost sure to drop out in the cooking and even if it fails to do so none will be the wiser but take it for a provision of nature as indeed it ought to be now if anybody is rude enough to gainsay your fish in the market you have the evidence of the eyes and hands against that of the nose alone why bless me madam i used to say a lady like you that understands fish a great deal better than i do his eyes are coming out of his head ma'am to hear you say such things of him afloat he was at four this morning and his eyes will speak to it and so he was well afloat in my tub before i began to prepare him for a last appeal to the public only they must not float too long or the scales will not be stiff enough being up a few of these things and feeling very keenly how hard the public always tries to get upper hand of me and would beat me down to half nothing a pound if allowed altogether its own way i fought very bravely the whole of that monday to turn a few honest shillings good old davy fine old davy brave old davy they said i was every time i abated a halfpenny and i called them generous gentlemen and christian-minded ladies every time they wanted to smell my fish which is not right before payment what right has any man to disparage the property of another when you have bought him he is your own and you have the title to canvass him but when he is put in the scales remember nothing but good of the dead if you remember anything as i sat by the crossroads in bridge end on the bottom of a bucket and with a four-legged dressing-table hired for tuppence in front of me who should come up but the well-known brother hezekiah truly tired i was getting after plodding through merthyr moor ogmore and Wenny, Lailston and newcastle and driven at last to the town of bridgend for some of my fish had a gamesome odour when first i set off in the morning and although the rain had cooled down the air 
it was now become an unwise thing to recommend what still remained to any man of unchristian spirit or possessing the ear of the magistrates now perhaps i should not say this thing and many may think me inclined to vaunt and call me an old coxcomb but if any man could sell stinking fish in the times of which i am writing and then it was ten times harder than now because women looked after marketing that man i verily believe was this old davy llewellyn and right he has to be proud of it but what were left on my hands that evening were beginning to get so strong that i feared they must go over bridge end bridge into the river ogmore the big coach with the london letters which came then almost twice a week was just gone on after stopping three hours to rest the horses and feed the people and i had done some business with them for london folk for the most part have a kind and pleasing ignorance they paid me well and i served them well with fish of a fine high flavour but now i had some which i would not offer to such kind-hearted gentry hezekiah wanted fish i saw it by his nostrils and i knew it for certain when he pretended not to see me or my standing he went a good bit round the corner as if to deal with the ironmonger but for all that i knew as well as if i could hear his wife beginning to rake the fire that fish for supper was the business which had brought him across the bridge therefore i refused an offer which i would have jumped at before seeing hezekiah of twopence a pound for the residue from an old woman who sold pickles and i made up my mind to keep up the price knowing the man to have ten in family and all blessed with good appetites what davy brother davy he cried being compelled to begin because i took care not to look at him has it been so ordered that i behold good brother davy with a fish upon a monday his object in this was plain enough to beat down my goods by terror of an information for sabbath labour the lord has been merciful to me i answered patting my best fish on his shoulder not only in sending them straight to my net at nine o'clock this morning but also brother hezekiah in the hunger all people have for them i would that i could have kept thee a taste not soon wouldst thou forget it sweeter fish and finer fish never came out of newton bay this i said because newton bay is famous for high quality but brother hezekiah thou art come too late and i began to pack up very hastily what cried hezekiah with a keen and hungrily grievous voice all those fish bespoken davy every one of them bespoken brother by a man who knows a right down good bass better almost than i do griffy the cat and snuffers now griffith who kept the cat and snuffers was a very jovial man and a bitter enemy to hezekiah perkins and i knew that the latter would gladly offer a penny a pound upon griffy's back to spoil him of his supper and to make him offend his customers stop brother davy cried hezekiah stretching out his broad fat hands as i began to pack my fish with the freshest smellers uppermost davy dear this is not right nor like our ancient friendship a rogue like griffy to cheat you so what has he beaten you down to davy beaten me down i said all in a hurry is it likely i would be beaten down with their eyes coming out of their heads like that now dear brother dio do have patience what was he going to give you a pound fourpence a pound and ten pound of them three and fourpence for a lot like that ah the times are bad indeed dear brother dio fourpence halfpenny three and nine down for the lot as it stands hezekiah for what do you take me cut a farthing in four when you get it do i look a likely man to be a rogue for fivepence no no davy don't be angry with me say as much as tenpence four and tuppence ready money and no irish coinage brother hezekiah said i 
a bargain struck is a bargain kept rob a man of his supper for tenpence oh dio dio you never would think of that man's supper with my wife longing for fish so such a family as we have and the weakness in hepzibah's back five shillings for the five davy there there take them along i cried at last with a groan from my chest you are bound to be the ruin of me but what can i do with a delicate lady brother surely you have been a little too hard upon me whatever shall i find to say to a man who never beats me down tell that worldly cat and snuffers that your fish were much too good why davy they seem to smell a little and small use they would be hezekiah either for taste or for nourishment unless they had the sea smell now brother all your money back and the fish to poor griffy if you know not the smell of salt water yet now don't you be so hot old davy the fish are good enough no doubt and it may be from the skewer wood but they have a sort not to say a smell but a manner of reminding one of the savoury stuff they feed on said i and the thorough good use they make of it a fish must eat and so must we and little blame to both of us with that he bade me good night and went with alacrity towards his supper scornfully sneering as he passed the door of the cat and snuffers but though it was a fine thing for me and an especial providence to finish off my stock so well at a time when i would have taken gladly a shilling for the lot of it yet i felt that circumstances were against my lingering even if hezekiah unable to enter into the vein of my fish should find himself too fat to hurry down the steep hill after me still there were many other people fit for supper and fresh for it from the sudden coolness whom it was my duty now to preserve from mischief by leaving proper interval for consideration before i might happen to be in front of their dining-room windows another day therefore with a grateful sense of goodwill to all customers i thought it better to be off there i had been for several hours ready to prove anything but never challenged by anybody and my spirit had grown accordingly but i never yet have found it wise to overlie success win it and look at it and be off is the quickest way to get some more so i scarcely even called so much as a pint at the cat and snuffers to have a laugh with griffy but set off for newton along the old road with a good smart heel and a fine day's business and a light heart inside of me when i had passed red hill and tithegston and clearly was out upon newton down where the glow-worms are most soft and sweet it came upon me in looking up from the glow-worms to the stars of heaven to think and balance how far i was right in cheating hezekiah it had been done with the strictest justice because his entire purpose was purely to cheat me whereupon providence had stepped in and seen that i was the better man i was not so ungrateful let nobody suppose it as to repine at this result so far from that that i rattled my money and had a good laugh and went on again but being used to watch the stars as an old sailor is bound to do i thought that orion ought to be up and i could not see orion this struck me as an unkindly thing although when i thought of it next day i found that orion was quite right and perhaps the beer a little strong which had led me to look out for him anyhow it threw me back to think of hezekiah and make the worst of him to myself for having had the best of him everybody may be sure that i never would have gone out of the way to describe my traffic with that man unless there were good reason nay but i wanted to show you exactly the cast and the colour of man he was by setting forth his low attempt to get my fish for nothing there was no man of course in my native village and very few in bridge end perhaps to whom i would have sold those fish unless they were going to sell it again but hezekiah perkins 
a member and leading elder of the nicodemus christians was so hard a man to cheat except by stirring of his gall and so keen a cheat himself so proud moreover of his wit and praying and truly brotherly that to lead him astray was the very first thing desired by a sound churchman by trade and calling he had been before he received his special call no more than a common blacksmith now a blacksmith is a most useful man full of news and full of jokes and very often by no means drunk this however was not enough to satisfy hezekiah having parts as he always told us and sometimes we wished that he had no whole cultivated parts moreover and taken up by the gentry nothing of a lower order came up to his merits than to call himself as follows horologist gunsmith practical turner working goldsmith and jeweller maker of all machinery and engineman to the king and queen the first time he put this over his door all the neighbours laughed at him knowing in spite of the book he had got full of figures and shapes and crossings which he called three gunometry that his education was scarcely up to the rule of three without any guns nevertheless he got on well having sense enough to guide him when to talk large in the presence of people who love large talk as beyond them and when to sing small and hold his tongue and nod at the proper distances if ever his business led him among gentry of any sense or science such as we sometimes hear of hence it was that he got the order to keep the church clock of bridge end a-going by setting the hands on twice a day and giving a push to the pendulum and so long as the clock would only go nobody in the town cared a tick whether it kept right time or wrong and if people from the country durst say anything about it it was always enough to ask them what their own clocks had to say there were not then many stable clocks such as are growing upon us now so that every horse had his own dinner bell only for all those that were hezekiah received i dare say from five to ten shillings a month apiece in order to keep them moving but bless my heart he knew less of a clock than i old davy llewellyn and once on a time i asked him when he talked too much of his ometries as a sailor might do in his simpleness i asked him to take an observation as i had seen a good deal of it but all he did was to make a very profane and unpleasant one as for this man's outward looks he was nothing at all particular but usually with dirt about him and a sense of oiliness why he must needs set up for a saint the father of evil alone may tell but they said that the clock that paid him best being the worst in the neighbourhood belonged to a nicodemus christian with a great cuckoo over it having never seen it i cannot say and the town is so full of gossip that i throw myself down on my back and listen being wholly unable to vie with them in depth or in compass of story-telling even when fish are a week on my hands end of chapter twelve chapter thirteen of the maid of skur this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by jennifer painter the maid of skur by r d blackmore chapter thirteen the coroner and the coronet an officer of high repute had lately been set over us to hold account of the mischief and to follow evidence and make the best he could of it when anybody chose to die without giving proper notice he called himself coroner of the king and all the doctors such as they were made it a point that he must come whenever there was a dead man or woman who had died without their help now all about the storm of sand and all about the shipwreck was known in every part of the parish before the church clock had contrived in gratitude to hezekiah 
to strike the noon of monday every child that went to the well knew the truth of everything and every woman of newton and nottage had formed from the men her own opinion and was ready to stand thereby and defy all the other women nevertheless some busy doctor who had better been in the stocks took it for a public duty to send notice and demand for the coroner to sit upon us the wrath of the parish now just beginning to find some wreck that would pay for the ropes was so honest and so grave that the little doctor was compelled to run and leave his furniture and so it always ought to be with people who are meddlesome it came to my knowledge that this must happen and that i was bound to help in it somewhere about middle day of tuesday at a time when i was not quite as well as i find myself when i have no money for being pleased with my luck perhaps and not content quite to smoke in the dark and a little dry after the glow-worms it happened i will not pretend to say how that i dropped into the jolly sailors to know what the people could be about making such a great noise as they were and keeping a quiet man out of his bed there i smelled a new tobacco directly i was in the room and somebody pleased with my perception gave me several pipes of it with a thimbleful as i became more and more agreeable of a sort of rum and water and confining myself as my principle is to what the public treat me to it is not quite out of the question that i may have been too generous and truly full i was of grief upon the following morning that somebody had made me promise in a bubbling moment to be there again and bring my fiddle on the tuesday night now since the death of my dear wife who never put up with my fiddle except when i was courting her it had seemed to my feelings to be almost a levity to go fiddling also i knew what everybody would begin to say of me but the landlord foreseeing a large attendance after the coroner's inquest would not for a moment hear of any breach of my fiddle pledge half of newton and perhaps all nottage went to skur the following day to see the coroner and to give him the benefit of their opinions and another piece of luck there was to tempt them in that direction for the ship which had been wrecked and had disappeared for a certain time in a most atrocious manner was rolled about so by the tide and a shift of the wind on monday that a precious large piece of her stern was in sight from the shore on tuesday morning it lay not more than a cable's length from low water mark and was heaved up so that we could see as far as the starboard mizzen chains part of the taffrail was carried away and the carving gone entirely but the transom and transom knees stood firm and of the ship's name done in gold i could make out in large letters ta lucia and underneath in a curve and in smaller letters ador of course no one except myself could make head or tail of this but after thinking a little while i was pretty sure of the meaning of it namely that the craft was portuguese called the santa lucia and trading from san salvador the capital of brazils and in this opinion i was confirmed by observing through my spy-glass copper bolt-heads of a pattern such as i had seen at lisbon but never in any british ship however i resolved for the present to keep my opinion to myself unless it were demanded upon good authority for it made me feel confused in mind and perhaps a little uneasy when being struck by some resemblance i pulled from the lining of my hat a leaf of a book upon which i copied all that could be made out of the letters each side of the tiller of my new boat and now i found them to be these you see from the starboard side just where they would have stood in lucia and door from the farther end of the line just as in san salvador the sands were all alive with people and the rocks and every place where anything good might have drifted for evan thomas could scarcely come at a time of such affliction to assert his claims of wreck 
and to belabour right and left. Therefore, for a mile or more, from where the land begins to dip, and the old stone wall, like a jagged cord, divides our parish from Kenvig, hundreds of figures might be seen, running along the grey wet sands, and reflected by their brightness. The day was going for two of the clock, and the tide growing near to the turn of ebb, and the land springs oozing down from the beach, spread the whole of the flat sand so, with a silver overlaying, that without keen sight it was hard to tell where the shore ended and sea began, and a great part of this space was sprinkled with naked feet going pattering, boys and girls, and young women and men, who had left their shoes up high on the rocks to have better chance in the racing. Now it is not for me to say that all or half of these good people were so brisk because they expected any fine thing for themselves. I would not even describe them as waiting in readiness for the force of fortune by the sea administered. I believe that all were most desirous of doing good, if possible. In the first case, to the poor people drowned, but if too late, then to console any disconsolate relations, failing of which, it would be hard if anybody should blame them for picking up something for themselves. "'What? You here, Mother Probin? I cried, coming upon a most pious old woman, who led the groaning at Zoar Chapel, and being for the moment struck out of all my manners by sight of her. "'Indeed, and so I am, old Davy,' she answered, without abashment, and almost too busy to notice me. The Lord may bless my poor endeavours to rescue them poor injuns, but I can't get on without a rake, if I had only the sense to bring my garden rake. There are so many little things, scarcely as big as cockle shells, and the waves do drag them away from me. Oh, there! And there goes another. Gwenny, if I don't smack you! All these people, and all their doings, I left with a sort of contempt, perhaps, such as breaks out on me now and then, at any very great littleness. And I knew that nothing worth wet of the knees could be found with the ebb tide running, and ere the hold of the ship broke up. So I went toward the great house, whose sorrows and whose desolation they took little heed of, and nothing made me feel more sad, strange as it may seem, and was, than to think of poor black Evan, thus unable to stand up, and fight for his unrighteous rights. In the great hall were six bodies. Five of strong young men laid quiet, each in his several coffin, and the other of a little child, in a simple dress of white, stretched upon a piece of board. Death I have seen in all his manners, since I was a cabin boy, and I took my hat off to the bodies, as I had seen them do abroad. But when I saw the small, dead child, a thrill and pang of cold went through me. I made sure of nothing else, except that it was dear Bardi, that little darling whom I loved, for her gifts direct from God, and her ways, so out of the way to all other children. It struck my heart with a power of death, that here this lively soul was dead. When a man makes a fool of himself, Anybody may laugh at him, and this does him good, perhaps, and hardens him against more trouble. But bad as I am, and sharp as I am, in other people's opinion, and proud sometimes to think of it, I could not help a good gulp of a tear over what I believed to be the body of poor little Bardy. For that child had such nice ways, and took such upper hand of me, that expecting to find a captain always, especially among women. Old oh, Davy, I ain't so. Old oh, Davy, Enny's a coming. By the Union Jack, it was as good as a dozen kegs of rum to me. There was no mistaking the sweetest and clearest voice ever heard outside of a flute, and presently began pit-pat of the prettiest feet ever put in a shoe down the great oak staircase. She held on by the rails, and showed no fear at all about it, though the least slip might have killed her. Then she saw the sad black sight after she turned the corner, and wondered at the meaning of it, and her little heart stood still. 
as she turned to me in awe, and held out both hands quivering, I caught her up, and spread my grey beard over her young, frightened eyes, and took her out of sight of all those cold and very dreadful things. I had never been up the stairs before in that dark and ancient house, and the length and the width and the dreariness and the creaking noises frightened me, not so much for my own sake, being never required to sleep there, but for the tender little creature, full already of timid fancies, who must spend the dark nights there. And now the house, left empty of its noise and strength and boastfulness, had only five more ghosts to wander silent through the silent places. And this they began the very night after their bodies were in the churchyard. The coroner came on an old white pony, nearly four hours after the time for which his clerk had ordered us. Being used, for my part, to royal discipline, and everything done to the minute fixed, with the captain's voice like the crack of a gun, I was vexed and surprised, but expected him to give us some reason, good or bad. Instead of that, he roared out to us, with his feet still in both stirrups, is there none of you taffies with manners enough to come and hold a gentleman's horse? Here you, Davy Jones, you are long enough and lazy enough. Put your hand to the bridle, will you? This was to me, who was standing by, in the very height of innocence, having never yet seen any man appointed to sit upon dead bodies, and desiring to know how he could help them. I did for his honour all I could, although his manner of speech was not in any way to my liking. But my rule has always been that of the Royal Navy, than which there is no wiser. If my equal insults me, I knock him down. If my officer does it, I knock under. Meanwhile, our people were muttering, Sassenach, Sassenach, and from their faces it was plain that they did not like an Englishman to sit upon Kimrick bodies. However, it was the old, old thing. The Welsh must do all the real work, and the English be paid for sitting upon them after they are dead. I never sat on a black man yet, and I won't sit on a black man now, the coroner said, when he was sure about oats enough for his pony. I'll not disgrace His Majesty's writ by sitting upon damned niggers. Glory be to God, Your Honour! straddling williams cried who had come as head of the jury clerk he was of newton church and could get no fees unless upon a christian burial we thought your honour would hardly put so great a disgrace upon us but we knew not how the law lay the law requires no christian man pronounced the coroner that all might hear to touch pitch and defile himself both in body and soul master clerk to lower and defile himself hereupon a high hard screech which is all we have in wales for the brave hurrah of englishmen showed that all the jury were of one accord with the coroner and i was told by somebody that all had shaken hands and sworn to strike work rather than put up with misery of conscience but your honour said mr lewis bailiff to colonel locker if we hold no quest on the black men, how shall we certify anything about this terrible shipwreck? The wreck is no concern of mine, answered the crowner, crustily. It is not my place to sit upon planks, but upon Christian bodies. Do you attend to your own business, and leave mine to me, sir? The bailiff, being a nice quiet man, thought it best to say no more. But some of the people who were thronging from every direction to see his honour, told him about the little white baby found among the bladderweed. He listened to this, and then he said, "'Show me this little white infant discovered among the black men. My business here is not with infants, but with five young smothered men. However, if there be an infant of another accident, and of Christian colour, I will take it as a separate case, and damn the county in the fees.' We assured his lordship, as every one now began to call him, in virtue of his swearing so, which no doubt was right in a man empowered to make other people swear, 
we did our best at any rate to convince the crowner that over and above all black men there verily was a little child and for all one could tell a christian child entitled to the churchyard and good enough for him to sit on and so he entered the house to see it but if he had sworn a little before and more than i durst set down for him he certainly swore a great deal now and poured upon us a bitter heat of english indignation all the jury were taken aback and i as a witness felt most uneasy until we came to understand that his honour's wrath was justly kindled on account of some marks on the baby's clothes a coronet he cried stamping about a coronet on my young lord's pinafore and you stupid oafs never told me nobody knew except myself who had sailed with an earl for a captain what the meaning of this thing was and when the clerk of the church was asked rather than own his ignorance he said it was part of the arms of the crown and the crowner was bound like a seal by it this explanation satisfied all the people of the parish except a few far-going baptists with whom it was a point of faith always to cavil and sneer at every wind of doctrine as they always called it the scent of which could be traced anyhow to either the parson or the clerk or even the grave-digger but i was content to look on and say nothing having fish to sell at least twice a week and finding all customers orthodox until they utter bad shillings End of chapter 13「there is no need for me to follow all the crowner's doings or all that the juries thought and said which was different altogether from what they meant to think and say and he found himself bound to have two of them with first right of inquest to the baby because of the stamp on his pinafore and here i was foreman of the jury with fifteen pence for my services and would gladly have served on the other jury after walking all that way but was disabled for doing so and only got nine pence for testimony with that however i need not meddle as every one knows all about it only to make clear all that happened and indeed to clear myself i am forced to put before you all that we did about that baby as fully and emphatically as the state of our doings upon that occasion permitted me to remember it for the coroner sat at the head of the table in the great parlour of the house and the dead child came in on his board and we all regarded him carefully especially heeding his coronet mark and then set him by the window a fine young boy enough to look at about the age of our bardy and might have been her twin brother as everybody vowed he was only his face was bolder and stronger and his nose quite different and altogether a brave young chap instead of funny and delicate all this however might well have come from knocking about in the sea so much i would have given a good half-crown to have bitten off my foolish tongue when one of the jurymen stood up and began to address the coroner he spoke unluckily very good english and his honour was glad to pay heed to him and the clerk put down nearly all he said word for word as might be this meddlesome fellow being no less than brother hezekiah's self nodded to me for leave to speak which i could not deny him and his honour lost no time whatever to put his mouth into his rummer of punch as now provided for all of us and to bow whenever his mouth was empty to that hezekiah for the man had won some reputation or rather had made it for himself by perpetual talking as if he were skilled in the history and antiquities of the neighbourhood 
of these he made so rare a patchwork heads and tails prose verse and proverbs histories and his stories that as i heard from a man of real teaching and learning who met him once and kept out of his way ever after any one trusting him might sit down in the chair of canute at king arthur's table not that i or any of my neighbours would be the worse for doing that only the thought of it frightened us and made us unwilling to hearken him much however if there was any matter on which hezekiah deserved to be heard no doubt it was this upon which he was now delivering his opinions to wit the great inroad or invasion of the sand for miles along our coast of which there are very strange things to tell and of which he had made an especial study having a field at candleston with a shed upon it and a rick of hay all which disappeared in a single night and none was ever seen afterwards it was the only field he had being left to him by his grandmother and many people were disappointed that he had not slept with his cow that night this directed his attention to the serious consideration as he always told us at first start being a lover of three decked words of the most important contemplation which could occupy the attention of any cambrian landowner show your land cried a wag of a tailor with none to cross his legs upon but we put him down and pegged him down till his manner should be of the pattern book hezekiah went on to tell in words too long to answer the helm of such a plain sailor as i am how the sweep of hundreds of miles of sand had come up from the west and southwest in only two hundred and fifty years how it had first begun to flow about the scilly islands as mentioned by one more lace and came to the mouth of hale river in cornwall in the early years of king henry the eighth and after that blocked up bude haven and swallowed the ploughs in the arable land then at lanant it came like a cloud over the moon one winter night and buried five-and-thirty houses with the people in them an act of parliament was passed chapter the second of philip and mary to keep it out of glamorganshire and good commissioners were appointed and a survey made along the coast especially of kenfig nevertheless the dash of sand was scarcely on their ink when swarming driving darkening the air the storm swept on their survey at the mouths of the tawi and afan rivers the two sailors chapels were buried and then it swept up the great roman road a branch of the julian way and smothered the pillars of gordian and swallowed the castle of kenfig which stood by the side of the western road and still rushing eastward took newton village and newton old church beneath it and so it went on for two hundred years coming up from the sea no doubt carried by the perpetual gales which always are from the south and west filling all the hollow places changing all bright mossy pools into hills of yellow drought and like a great encampment dwelling over miles and leagues of land and like a camp it was in this that it was always striking tent six times in the last few years had the highest peak of sand the general's tent it might be called been shifted miles away perhaps and then come back towards ogmore and it was only the other day that through some shift or swirl of wind a windmill with its sails entire had been laid bare near candleston of which the last record was in court rolls of a hundred and fifty years agone now all this though hezekiah said it was true enough i do believe having heard things much to the same purpose from my own old grandfather the coroner listened with more patience than we had given him credit for although he told us that brother perkins should have reserved his learned speech for the second inquiry which was to be about the deaths of the five young men for to him it appeared that this noble infant must lay the blame of his grievous loss not on the sand but upon the sea 
hezekiah replied with great deference that the cause in both cases was the same for that the movement of sand went on under the sea even more than ashore and hence the fatal gulfing of that ship the andalusia and the loss of his young lordship the name he had given the ship surprised me and indeed i felt sure that it was quite wrong and so i said immediately without any low consideration of what might be mine own interest but the coroner would not hearken to me being much impressed now with the learning and wisdom of hezekiah perkins and when hezekiah presented his card beginning with horologist and ending with the king and queen he might have had any verdict he liked if he himself had been upon trial therefore after calling in for the sake of form the two poor women who found the dead baby among the seaweed and had seven pence apiece for doing so and who cried all the while that they talked in welsh each having seen a dear baby like him not more than twenty years ago we came in the most unanimous manner under his lordship's guidance to the following excellent verdict found drowned on pool tavan rock a man-child supposed to be two years old believed to be a young nobleman from marks on pinafore and high bearing but cast away by a storm of sand from the ship andalusia of appledore now i was as certain as sure could be that half of this verdict must be wrong especially as to the name of the ship and her belonging to appledore which never yet owned any craft of more than two hundred tons at the utmost a snow or a brig at the very outside nevertheless i was compelled to give in to the rest of them and most of all to the coroner only i said as many who are still alive can remember and are not afraid to speak to and especially my good friend mr lewis the ship was not called the andalusia the ship was never from appledore neither was she of british build as an old seaman it is likely that i know more of the build of a ship than a lubber of a clockmaker or rather a clock mauler but here i was put down sternly and hearing of verdicts a great deal worse without any mischief come of them i was even content to sign the return and have a new pipe of bird's eye and a bird's eye view this gave me of them at the second inquest wherein i had to give evidence and was not of the jury they wanted to cross-examine me because i had been unpleasant but of that they got the worst and dropped it but as all our jurymen declared upon their oaths that the little nobleman was drowned in a storm of sand so they found that the five young rabbiters came to their end of smothering through a violent sea tempest in the days of my youth such judgments perhaps would have tried my patience but now i knew that nothing ever follows truth and justice people talk of both these things and perhaps the idea does them good be that according to god's will as we always say when deprived of our own at any rate i am bound to tell one little thing more about each quest and first about the first one why was i so vexed and angry with my foolish tongue when hezekiah began to speak only because i knew full well that it would lead to the very thing which it was my own desire to avoid if possible and this as you may guess at once after what happened on the stairs was the rude fetching and exposing of the dear little maid among so many common fellows and to show her the baby corpse i feared that it must come to this through my own thoughtless blabbing about her ickle brother in the presence of hezekiah and if ever man had a hollow dry heart from over-pumping of the tongue i had it when hezekiah came in bearing in a depth of fright and wonder and contempt of him my own delicate bardie i had set my back against the door and sworn that they should not have her but crafty perkins had stolen out by another door while they humoured me 
now my pretty dear was awed and hushed beyond all crying and even could not move her feet as children do in a kicking way trying to get as far as possible from hezekiah's nasty face which gave me a great deal of pleasure because she had never done the like to me unless i were full of tobacco she stretched away from his greasy shoulder and then she saw old davy her hands came toward me and so did her eyes and so did her lips with great promise of kisses such as her father and mother perhaps might have been mightily tempted by but nobody now to care for them when hezekiah pretending to dandle this little lady in a jaunty way like one of his filthy low children was taking her towards that poor little corpse so white in the light of the window and when he made her look at it and said is that ickle bother my dear and she all the time was shivering and turning her eyes away from it and seeking for me to help her i got rid of the two men who held me nor hearkened i the coroner but gave hezekiah such a grip as he felt for three months afterwards and with bardie on my left arm kept my right fist ready nobody cared to encounter this for i had happened to tell the neighbourhood how the frenchman's head came off at the time when he tried to injure me and so i bore off the little one till her chest began to pant and her tears ran down my beard and then as i spoke softly to her and began to raise her fingers and to tickle her frizzy hair all of a sudden she flung both arms around my neck and loved me oh davy poor ickle bardy not go to e back pit hole yet no my dear not for ever so long not for eighty years at least and then go straight to heaven ickle bother go to e back pit hole does a think old davy this was more than i could tell though inclined to think it very likely however before i could answer some of the jury followed us and behind them the coroner himself they insisted on putting a question to her and so long as they did not force her again to look at that which terrified her i had no right to prevent them they all desired to speak at once but the clerk of the coroner took the lead having as yet performed no work toward the earning of his salt or rum an innocent old man he was but very free from cleanliness and the child being most particular of all ever born in that matter turned away with her mite of a nose in a manner indescribable he was much too dull to notice this but putting back his spectacles and stooping over her hair and ears which was all she left outside my beard he wanted to show his skill in babies of which he boasted himself a grandfather and so he began to whisper my little dear you will be a good child a very good child won't you now i can see it in your little face such a pretty dear you are and all good children always do as they are told you know we want you to tell us a little thing about pretty little brother i have got a little girl at home not so old as you are and she is so clever you can't think everything she does and says everything we tell her take a ye e nasty old man take a ye e bad old man or i never tis again old davy she flashed up at me with such wrath that i was forced to obey her while the old man put down his goggles to stare and all the jury laughed at him and i was running away with her for her little breath was hot and short when the coroner called out stop man i know how to manage her at this i was bound to pull up and set her to look at him as he ordered me she sat well up in my arms and looked and seemed not to think very highly of him look at his honour my dear said i stroking her hair as i knew she liked look at his lordship you pretty duck little child began his honour you have a duty to perform even at this early period of your very beginning life we are most desirous to spare your feelings having strong reasons to believe that you are sprung from a noble family but in our duty towards your lineage we must require you my little dear we must request you my little lady to assist us in our endeavour to identify i can say dentify old davy tell e silly old man to say dentify same as i does 
she spread her little open hand with such contempt at the coroner that even his own clerk could not keep his countenance from laughing and his honour having good reason to think her a baby of high position before was now so certain that he said god bless her what a child she is take her away old mariner she is used to high society End of chapter fourteen